Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I had to put my phone on silent because my mother will call me <laughs> during this panel. So sorry for the delay there. Um, I am so, so honored to be sitting down with, Ledro with Lejeune Montgomery Tabrone. She, of course, is the CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. They're doing important work that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to have time for audience questions after 30 minutes, so please be thinking about questions. If you said something very interesting that you want to ask her about, jot it down, think it through, um, and we will come to you. And if you don't have questions, I might call on you if, because we want people to ask questions. So <laughs> be ready for that. Um, but thank you so much, Lejeune, for being here. I'm going to try not to call you Ms. Ms. Tabron because my mom isn't here again, but like yes. I will, so I'll try to go by <laughs> Lejeune. Yes, um, but you're doing a lot of work on racial healing, and you often start the conversations that you're having all over the country with a sort of opening exercise. So explain what it is and then t take us through it. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are going to partake, Yamish and I, um, in something that's called conocimiento. And basically, conocimiento is a way of, of getting to know someone. It's about acknowledging their presence, attaching to their common humanity, and making sure that as you have further dialogue that we start off in a place where we are being seen and are, we've affirmed each other's presence and value and worth. And so what happens in a conocimiento is we start out by asking questions that allow us to tell our stories. And so the first question, the question that we're going to ask each other today is, what is the origin of your name? So I'm going to share the origin of my name, and then I'm going to ask uh, Yamish to sh share the origin of her name. So my name is Lejeune Montgomery Tabron. When I asked my mother where Lejeune came from, uh, it was a very interesting story, because um, you know there aren't a lot of Lejeunes around the world. And what she said is, because of the military background in my family, she was very drawn to Camp Lejeune, which mm. is in North Carolina. And she loved that name. And my, my father was in the Army, and my brother was in the Marines, and Camp Lejeune is a Marine base. And so she just said, I just felt that was a pretty name, and I wanted you to have it. I also say, because I'm number nine of 10 children, that she was running out of names. Um, and in fact, I don't even have a middle name because Lejeune was just Lejeune. She was like, I'm done. Um, so that's my first name. Montgomery is my, my married name. I mean, my maiden name. And Montgomery is very significant for us uh, and for our family because I'm an ancestor of Isaiah T. Montgomery, who founded Mount Bayou, Mississippi in the South. Mount Bayou, Mississippi became one of the most wealthiest places for African Americans. Uh, it was uh, a place where it was an economic boom and vitality for freed slaves who went to Mount Bayou. Uh, it was then, of course, through structural racism, uh, dismantled, unfortunately, because uh, it was actually very, very, very successful. Uh, and finally, T Tabron is my married name, uh, and it, I cherish it because I actually married my childhood sweetheart after a, a very circuitous journey. But uh, together, we uh, have great four children, and it's just, uh, a story of love. So that's who I am. And as you can see, as you go into the origin of your name, you begin to connect with another person around what's important to you. So Yamish, what, what is the origin of your name? Well, I'm going to fight the urge not to ask you about your boo, because I definitely <laughs> want to know the security yes. situation there. But I'll ask you that that's after. Right. I'll ask, you, I'll ask you that later. <laughs> Um, thank you for asking. So my name is Yamish. I'll send, my name is Yamish Leon Alcindor, um, and Klein is my married name. Um, so Yamish, my, I say I always tell people that it means hippie Haitians because it was the '80s. My parents were in love. They decided, oh my God, we're so in love, we're going to put our names together. So my mother's name is Yamik, 
And my father's name is Michel. They're Haitian, so Michel, not Michael. He will remind you. So his name is Michel. So they put their names together to make Yamish. And my, my grandfather was mad about my name because he thought my mother didn't get enough letters. He said my name should be Yamish because there's just one more letter for the, for the Yannick. But it, we, they settled on Yamish. Leon is from my grandmother. She, her, that was her middle name. Um, she raised me. My first language in life was Haitian Creole because my mother, my mother's mother was, uh, well, all of my family is from Haiti and my, par my parents immigrated from Haiti, met at Boston College, so they immigrated separately and connected in Boston, but my grandmother was a big part of my life. The reason why I speak Haitian Creole fluently, I think about her every single day because I just know as someone who came to this country in her 70s, who left everything she knew behind, for a dream of what my life could be, that her, that she would just be blown away. That she would just be blown away at the fact that I'm walking into the White House and doing all these big things, so I just think about her all the time. Alcindor is Haitian roots. Um, I know some of you might think I'm related to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, he also is an Alcindor. I wonder if people ask him about me. I will, I will ask him one day. Um, but Alcindor is, my, is, is a Haitian name. We are, there, we are a number of generations back Haitian. My family uh, is a family of lawyers and doctors that were, that were in Haiti, um, connected to the, to the civil rights movement in Haiti, where we were founded in 1804 as the first free black nation. We were the only nation where the enslaved people pushed out the, the, the white masters and said, we want our country. And that's, so I'm very proud of that name. And the name that people don't really know is Klein. And I have a very beautiful love story. I'm a little security, maybe a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's my husband's name. His name is Klein. He's a, he's a journalist and we got married four years ago. So that oh, is my story. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, a great conocimiento because now as we continue to dialogue today, we can go back to the yeah. connections and we make connections around our love, around our ancestors really pursuing freedom and, and uh, prosperity. Yeah. And that will continue as we talk today about my favorite topic. Awesome. Well, of course, the, the topic of this discussion is racial healing. And I wanted to ask you about something that's happening today because it's such a historic day for race relations in our country. Um, Katanji Brown Jackson is now Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, she was sworn in and after 233 years of black women being locked out of the Supreme Court being passed over because it's not a coincidence that she's the first black woman. She's the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court. You are of course a trailblazer in your own right. You're the first woman and first black woman to lead Kellogg, the Kellogg Foundation. So talk a little bit about what Katanji's, um, what her accomplishment means to you, especially as someone who's also making your own history. I know it's not always easy to be the first. No, it isn't. And it, I have the utmost respect for her because I know for her to have achieved this level of success, she has worked extremely hard and uh, she has persevered. And I am just so proud that uh, she is taking that perspective into the highest court because what we need in the highest court is representation of the views and the you know the circumstances that people of color are living through today that appears to be ignored as we're looking at what's best for this country mm, certainly um, so let's dive into of course the discussion and what you spend a lot of your time on for those who maybe aren't familiar talk a little bit about why racial healing is needed and what that looks like yeah, um, and you know, this has been a journey at the Kellogg Foundation for decades. Our North Star goal is to improve the lives of the most vulnerable children. But in doing this work over decades, what we've learned is you can either work on the symptoms or you can look at the root causes. And what we've learned is we encounter the issues of children and families, root causes stem from racism. And if we are not going to address those racialized structures that really impact the lives of people and how they are trying to pursue uh, better pathways, that we're really just nibbling around the edges of a very systemic problem. And so we wanted to take racial equity on, dead on, to say we got to talk about the systems that create these outcomes. But what we learned is you can't just go right into and have a conversation about racial equity. Healing, we say, is the path to racial equity. It's at the heart of how you get to equity. It's a 
head and a heart game. And the healing is about building trust, it's about building relationships, it's about storytelling and allowing everyone to be affirmed and validated around their story. And together, once you, you get to the place where we are talking about our own shared humanity, then you can begin to talk about how do we create the pathways for it for everyone. So racial equity is, is about the transformation that needs to take place, but healing is the path by which you get there. Um, and so our journey around healing, people think it's the, the soft stuff, right? Sometimes we've been talking about healing now for several decades, but when we began, I actually had someone say, why is Kellogg funding this healing work? It's the hardest part of the journey. It is truly where we come together and respect one another as human beings and begin to figure out how we can coexist and create alternatives and opportunities for everyone. So that's our work. And as part of that work, you're in 14 communities. I mean, I want to read, it's the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Framework. So talk to us about those 14 communities and how that framework plays into that. Thank you. And yes, our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation work was really a, a co-creation with all of our partners. We brought together over 100 of our partners and grantees, and we talked about what is it going to take to transform communities. And it was actually in a moment, if you think about 2017, it was a moment where people were losing faith in our national systems. And what we believed was this work can happen locally. This can be community work. And it can be about bringing people together, the truth of truth, racial healing and transformation. It's about storytelling. It's about bringing people together in a community and allowing them to share their experiences in their communities from their own truth and perspective. The racial healing part was in connecting everyone, bringing them together, allowing them to learn and understand the systems that work in their communities and those that don't, and, and why and why not. And then finally, the transformation was, let's work together and change these systems for the better. So we came up with this framework truly in partnership with others really thinking about uh, methodologies around healing that would work. And our, the methodology that was created is uh, really based on a lot of indigenous traditions of healing circles uh, that affirms everyone, that makes sure that everyone uh, is seen and heard in the circle. But it is really deeply about our commonness and our common humanities and understanding how to navigate the diversity of us as human beings, but yet the pathway forward. So that's truth, racial healing, and transformation. Once the methodology was set, it was like, where do we do this work, right? And the 14 communities, a lot of those communities, it was a pull. They were dealing with circumstances where they were ready to do this work. Like Dallas, it followed the police shooting in Dallas. In Baton Rouge, there was a police shooting. Uh, Chicago, there's been ongoing violence. So when we talk about our 14 places, you can probably map them to news stories. But they all were ready to say, enough is enough. We want to do this hard work. And so we have a framework around, if you're going to do this work, you have to have certain stakeholders in the room. So it couldn't just be people talking to the choir. You had to include people who would be opposed, um, leaders in the community that create these systems. We know systems don't just happen out of thin air. People create these communities that create disparities. So how do we deal with the leaders in communities and have them understand the impact of their decisions and to build better systems for all to thrive. So 14 communities, they've been working at this now since about 2017, and they've truly now created transformative policies and practices that serve more of their communities and the work continues. Can you talk about an aha moment or a moment or a community where you see this is the sort of specific change that's happening? Yeah, and, and I like to start with Kalamazoo because Kalamazoo and the Battle Creek community, my community, they joined together and worked on this uh, effort. And in Kalamazoo, 
they were really addressing housing policy. And uh, there were very discriminatory housing practices that were happening in Kalamazoo. And uh, people were losing their homes, uh, particularly during COVID. Uh, more people were homeless. Uh, the, pop the homeless population in Kalamazoo was really so bad that they were just living along the river. And mm. no one ha could think of what to do. Mm. And the TRHT coalition came together and decided that they wanted to address these discriminatory housing practices. And they formed these bodies of work. They connected all the nonprofit organizations that work in this space. And they actually were able and successful to change the housing ordinance in Kalamazoo that prevented all of these discriminatory practices for in the future. So, you know, landlords could not discriminate, people could not be um, certain backgrounds that were based on your income and race, and things were not allowed any longer. And coming out of that, today there's an organization in Kalamazoo that has gone across the nation to look at best practices around housing. And now they are beginning to build what they call tiny houses. Mm. And they're putting up these tiny houses, like 400 square feet, for the homeless. And just 50 pods they were able to, to put up, but all of the homeless issues that they had dealt with for decades, through this process, they were able to take it, change the policies, change the laws, give people a pathway to create housing communities for the homeless. And it's still ongoing, but it's an incredible body of work, and it takes us all the way from the truth to the racial healing and into the transformation. Well, that's a phenomenal story. Yes. It sounds incredible. Um, I also, you said something about sort of talking to the choir and preaching to the choir. How do you do this work, given the fact that our country is so segregated and people live in communities that a lot of times can be hump, can, can really just be a sort of a reflection of, their, of who they are and their races, even block by block when you go to different yes, places? Yes, it is. And we knew that going in. So the, the TRHT framework, it is required that we think about narrative change as a major way of shifting the narrative around uh, who we are as people and how we coexist. The other part of the framework was around healing. So those were two things that needed to be in place. And then there were these three pillars. One was segregation and separation. The second one was uh, criminal justice and mass incarceration. And the third was economy. Mm -hmm. How do we create better opportunities for all? And so when you look at that framework, we knew going in that we believe that segregation in and of itself is one of the most powerful tools for racism to continue. And we knew that because people were live in very isolated places with people like themselves for the most part, that we needed to address issues of separation and think about how do you bring people back together. Coupled with the separation is a current narrative, who controls the narrative, what people have access to or what they listen to, which we felt, again, was very isolated. Our goal was to begin to think about how do you not get into this polarized place from an either or, but a both and concept. So, First of all, starting with stories and validating everyone's stories, because everyone's story is their story. No one can debate that. So when we think about bringing people together and first around their stories and who they are and what validates them and how do we affirm them, but then as we go into more of the controversial topics, how do you think about those from a both and perspective? It's not your truth or my truth, but how could both of our truths exist? And does this mean that you're, you're sort of pulling from different communities and saying, okay, we're gonna make a conscious effort not to just stay like if, if you're talking about Washington DC and Anacostia, but we're gonna go through and make sure that there's racial diversity in different parts? The construct of the TRHT has to be yeah. diverse. 
Uh, and sometimes it's a smaller space. Sometimes it's across the state, like our TRHT work in Mississippi is in Mississippi, primarily in Jackson. Mm. But it's, you know, we need a diversity of participation to make that circle complete. Uh, and with that, of course, then comes how do you address some of the most difficult issues that may come up in that circle, which it, they will come up. And our methodology, I think, anticipates that and makes sure that when there is that kind of controversy, uh, that there's a way of dialogue that doesn't blame or shame anyone. Um, we kind of diffuse that, but we get to the root of uh, the stories behind these issues. And, and typically, it uh, ends with, uh, I think, a place of a, a deepening of understanding, a way that people can come together. You may not agree, but at least there's this level of awareness and understanding that gets built across our differences. And when you're talking about difficult topics, just in the last two weeks, you have the abortion ruling, you have January 6th, you have guns. These are some of the most sort of hardest topics and people are so passionate and it's, it goes to people's faith, right? It goes to yeah. sort of their culture and how they, were, how they grew up. How do you think our nation wades through those issues and is the Kellogg Foundation sort of doing the work or wanting to do the work in those topics? We definitely want to do the work on those topics. Uh, I've just, you know, we are about children and we want all children to thrive and uh, I have just seen way too many school shootings than I can ever tolerate, and I do think there a conversation needs to happen in that space around how do we protect our children? How do we make sure that their hearts and minds uh, can, can thrive in the next generation? And I, I keep sell, telling people, you know, we're the adults. They can't vote. We're supposed to vote to protect them, and yet nothing is happening to protect them on this such a serious topic. So definitely we want to engage around all these topics. Um, I can tell you one that we have been, I have been involved in, and that was in a healing circle where a, a white policeman was present with people from a community where the issue was police shootings. Uh, and again, this policeman days later said it transformed him, his life. But in the moment, the power that this person was used to drawing in a situation like this was diffused, which meant he had to listen to different points of views and perspectives. And it wasn't welcoming because that power dynamic is always more place with the person with the gun. And uh, so I've been in places where these very, very difficult conversations occur. Um, but again, our facilitators are very uh, skillful in getting to the story behind these circumstances and allowing people to connect around those stories to see that there are many perspectives to an issue. And it's really interesting that you say that and talk about many different perspectives because I'm thinking about the conversation we're having in this country around truth, right? Exactly. And, and, and sort of there isn't even a shared set of facts in many cases. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? Yeah, it's difficult, right? Uh, and what comes to mind, again, a very, very critical topic is, you know, is it history or is it critical race theory or... What is it named, or how do you talk about that history yeah. in a truthful way um, and have it not be politicized, which is what's happening in our country today. It, it, these topics are being politicized more than it, they are really uh, utilized for a sake of learning and bringing people together mm -hmm. and the connection and the common humanity that we can learn from these journeys. And so that's the work that we try to bring out is, what is that history? And it, there may be multiple versions, but let's put them all on there, on the table, and let's talk about how these versions impact lives. And then what might be the path forward where um, 
we understand the impact is different across different sectors of the population. Um, and in talking about racial healing, it, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Buffalo, New York. Yeah. You were in Buffalo before the shooting, but for those who don't remember, but of course it was such a shocking shooting, gunman comes into Buffalo, New York, targets the area because it's an African-American community, goes through and there's video of him shooting African-Americans and then passing over white shoppers in that grocery store. It was one of the most disturbing videos I've ever watched. I was just sort of undone after seeing that, still sort of undone after seeing that. How do you deal with that? Because you're doing the work and then this outsider comes in and tries to tear it all up. Yeah, and, and I can tell you how we're continuing to work in Buffalo today. Um, <clears throat> but our work in Buffalo, and they had a, a TRHT community, and prior to this event, and really prior to the pandemic, they were really focused on, when you talk about those three pillars, they were focused on the economy. And they had determined that uh, there weren't equal pathways to, cap to access to capital and had taken on a movement with their business roundtable to provide capital to businesses of color that wanted to start new businesses in Buffalo. And they had created a new structure within their community. People were accessing capital. Um, and what they also knew is that it would relate to local jobs then, and we were building community in that space. The other thing they had requested, and this was several years ago, was a train-the-trainer model because they wanted more healing practitioners mm. in their community. And they wanted to make sure that as this work was spreading, that people would be skilled to have these conversations. So we were funding them to create local healing tra practitioners. And then this event happened. Mm. And the one thing they needed more than anything was these healing practitioners. So we have a current body of work with them today that is about bringing more healing practitioners into Buffalo, and they are there on the ground today working with families and communities, all families and communities, because many people were very upset that this was an outsider. Um, and so by the time we're done, we're, we will have really grown the skill set and this issue of racial healing and the trauma that people deal with it, along with these issues is, is something that we're very much uh, wanting to continue to, to support across the nation, actually. One of our vision is uh, that we will have healing practitioners every place and everywhere because this dialogue is just necessary for the future. And for folks who hear that term, healing practitioner, what does that look like? Is it a social worker? Is it a mental health? Like, tell me a little bit more about what that, what that is. Yeah, it's, it's anyone who really has committed themselves to, to bringing people together and understanding this methodology of, uh, of true dialogue and storytelling. So, you know, people have been trained in this methodology, and uh, it's, you know, people in our own organization have taken this on as kind of a way forward, and they have become healing practitioners. Uh, so anyone can do this work, uh, but it's, it's just the commitment to listening, to really, you know, creating a safe space for people to have a conversation, to be vulnerable, to tell their stories, and to connect across uh, these different background life issues, yeah. and to then be committed to the transformation forward. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be calling for questions in about 30 to 45 seconds, so hopefully you have some questions. Um, while you think, your question, think through your questions, I will say, talk a little bit about Flint. You talked about all these other mm -hmm. communities. What's going on there? Yeah, Flint, uh, you all know, again, it was one of our TRHT communities. And uh, coming out of the water crisis, uh, there definitely was a need for healing, right? And there was also uh, a health issue that they needed to deal with. And the issue in Flint was that the people who were most impacted were not being heard. Mm. And our work there was really creating that new table where those who were uh, impacted by the water crisis, the young people who needed 
uh, support and wraparound services, the families of these young children who had the stories and the solutions just were not part of the table. Yeah. And so this TRHT process really allowed them to join in and be a part of the solution as it related to this. And then, you know, COVID hit. But the good thing is when COVID hit, because this structure already existed, they were able to utilize that structure then to think about, you know, how do we address the health concerns and make sure that we are accessing those in community who are impacted either as an essential worker or on the front lines or, you know, a, a contracted COVID and actually needed medical attention. Yeah. Great. Well, I will now open it up for questions. Uh, raise your hand. Do we have mics? Or, yeah, I think we have someone. Yeah, so we'll go. We'll start from the back and go here. Three. So one, two, three. Hi, I'm Parv from Strive Together. I'm curious how you allow, make your coalition sustain the focus on the right balance between talk and action, between see something, say something, and do something. Mm -hmm. And again, it was part of the structure. So there are a couple things that we embedded within the structure to make sure that that action would occur. So each community could select which action. So of those three pillars, they could work on housing and segregation. They could work on uh, criminal justice or they could work on the economy. They had that choice. But once they chose we had structures in place to make sure that that work was ongoing uh, based on the, the framework. The other thing that we required was that there be local partners so that it wouldn't just be Kellogg coming in with all the resources and as soon as the resources left, the work wouldn't continue. So part of the structure was there was a community foundation or a local fiduciary that also met, we matched some of the local investments so that there was ownership and that then they were very intentional about this is what we are pursuing as a community and this is how we're going to track it. And of course they were tracking, we've tracked it, we've had evaluation that goes alongside all of the communities had resources for evaluation so we could make sure that they were pursuing those results. Uh, this young man was next. And then we're going to go here. Right. Hi, my name is Sixto Cancer. I run an organization focused on transforming foster care. Um, you know, grew up in foster care, was adopted, was a very racist, abusive adoption, came back in. And I used to think that was a very unique story, but it's not. 53% of all black families will experience a child abuse investigation. 10% of all black children in the United States will experience foster care. And so I have a two-part question around, one, this sector could benefit from racial healing, and yet we're not there yet, and not having those deep conversations feels very normal for us to say, yes, we're disproportionately affected. Mm -hmm. um, so what advice do you give to folks who are trying to create that racial awakening within a particular sector, mm -hmm. and two, does any of, any of the work that you all are doing intersect um, specifically for child welfare? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Some of our work in the past has been particularly related to the foster care system. Uh, uh, and particularly related to people who time out of foster care as adults and need support. We've done that both in community as well as uh, their journey through higher ed, which has also been an interesting pathway. So over time, we've invested in that particular system. But I think your larger question around, you know, just vulnerable children in the child welfare system, it is an, it's an area that we have addressed from the perspective of trauma. And one of the things we've learned, particularly in New Orleans, when we first started working in New Orleans, we would go to New Orleans and they would ask, we would talk about, you know, their education system. And they would tell us, you know, if you're not going to deal with child trauma, and the fact that a lot of these young children have walked over a dead body on the way to school, have seen these types of, of murders, have had someone in their family shot. Uh, that trauma is so present and relevant that we don't even want to talk to you about education until we can figure out how to make our children safe and, and well. Uh, and so it has taken us into a place to really understand trauma and adverse childhood 
experiences, and it's work that we continue to encounter in our communities as we do our community work. And that's a, it's, it's such a really good topic. I know I have a couple of NBC folks. Jump on here. Could you get his information? Because I would, I would want to circle back with yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that sounds like a story that we Yeah. Have. So um, next up is Andy. Thanks. Um, could you please elaborate on the economic piece? Uh, tell us some of the objectives and also some of the successes that you've had. So <clears throat> in our space around economy, we've done a lot. So I'm going to kind of parse it out a little bit. So fundamentally, what we believe is for children to thrive, their families need to be stable places and create a safe space for them to thrive. And so families then, we know, need to have security. And so we look for livable wage, stable employment for families. And that could be either, you know, job opportunities in a community, or it could be they have a dream of starting their own business. So it could be, how do we support them through that financial pathway to securing financing and loans to start their own uh, business, entrepreneurship. We also look for you know, the systems that may not be equitable in that space and how we can help look at the barriers to employment and how we might help dismantle some of those systems so that everyone who is working and able and wants to be a part of that economy can participate. So that's one stream. The other stream that we've worked a lot on then is with corporate America to think about, you know, how might we support uh, in a community, the businesses that are there and the training and what's necessary for the families and the children. So, you know, an example of that is uh, in our New Orleans work, uh, there's, uh, they were in need of welders. And so what we did was we supported training women uh, and bringing people into the welding industry to match the needs for that particular community for um, what was happening in New Orleans. So every place is different, but we are working in community to kind of find out what the needs are and to try to be supportive around creating those pathways. Another pot body of work we're doing is we created this publication is called The Business Case for Racial Equity. Mm. And what we know is that if we were to really focus on giving everyone an opportunity that wanted one and, and to remove the disparities in that economic ecosystem between whites and people of color, if, if we had full equality, we could actually generate another $8 trillion of gross domestic product by 2050 just by making sure that everyone was fully engaged in the system. So understanding that uh, this isn't just a nice to do, it's also we're leaving money on the table if we're not doing it as an economy and there's a win-win scenario in there for everyone. And so we talk about that shared fate and how this is good for business and it's also good for children and families. So that's another stream. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about our expanding equity work, which is work that we're doing with corporations again around why there are such low representation of people in color, of color in many of these companies. And after the George Floyd murder, many companies made statements and finally expressed their understanding and awareness of these disparities, and they wanted to be a part of the solution, and they didn't quite know how. So what we've been doing at the Kellogg Foundation, because we have proclaimed ourselves to be an anti-racist organization and actually did that in 2007 and have been on the journey for almost two decades, um, We've been sharing our own practices on how we have become an organization that is 51% people of color and our board is 60% people of color. And all the lessons, we've been sharing that with corporate America in a way for them to change their practices and systems. And we started out with five companies. We said, you know, in the financial services sector, would you be our first cohort? We're now over 100 companies 
all really wanting to learn and, and make some significant transformation within their institutions and then be champions elsewhere. Uh, we only have time for probably two more questions. I saw your hand in the blue, and since we haven't been over here, maybe one, we'll come over here at some point. <laughs> Mine's really quick. Um, thank you for your ins inspiration and your action. I, I'm just, I'm, there's a Yiddish word, flaklumped. Um, <laughs> but uh, my question to you is, is the uh, healing practitioners, is that a volunteer position that well, there's a, like how does that work? It's a both there and there. Uh, so we believe that we want to professionalize this as well. So there is actually a center in Arkansas that we funded to give healing practitioner certifications so that people will actually have a credential in the space around healing that they can then uh, use in, as you know, their own uh, pathway for you know, a career. Yeah. In addition to that, there are people who just want to be a part of the solution, who have come into this space and uh, work for other organizations where this need for healing practitioners exists or they've you know, connected in this network. Yeah. And there is a growing network of people in this space uh, and we wanna scale that because we, it's just needed. One more question, last question. Over there, was over here. Did you have your hand up? <laughs> Hi, my name is Desi Hall and I run an organization that serves black trans students in post-secondary and high school age. And we, I live in Alabama where they just passed a horrible bill targeting black children. And I'm just curious, well not black children, but black children will be affected by it much more because some of the white trans kids, they, their parents can afford to take them out of the state to find healthcare and things. So mm -hmm. I'm very curious as like what it looks like for you all supporting that work around trans children and if you all are engaging in that way. I mean, we have yeah. a couple seconds left, and then, so if you just answer this question, and then I have one quick question, so. Okay. So just giving right. you the time cues. <laughs> so again, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that we have like a direct program there, uh, but again, as we see that intersection in the communities where we work, uh, we engage in those uh, conversations. It's, it's an interesting, our work is more in that early childhood space uh, when we think about um, the engagement with children in their earliest years, age zero to third grade. Yeah. Uh, but I, I understand the issue that you're uh, presenting is yeah, not I working. To, I should say done. I went to Alabama and yeah. reported on that story. It's definitely a story we should watch. Wow. Last quick question, super quick. Today we announced the Kellogg Foundation is joining forces with the NBC Universal News Group on an editorial collaboration focused on racial equity and healing sponsored by the foundation. In 30 seconds, just explain to people what this, what this is gonna be. So when I talked about narrative change, this is our moment. This is our moment to really amplify the stories of our people who are doing this work on the ground to amplify our National Day of Racial Healing, which is a day that we have every year, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we intentionally made it that day because we know that we are all inspired by Dr. King's vision and then action must follow. Yeah. And the National Day of Racial Healing is about how people are coming together and healing and acting yeah. to create opportunities for all. And our NBC partnership will be about telling those stories, showing how this work is truly happening on the ground and bringing people together uh, to really celebrate our success. Well, thank you so much, yes. June, for explaining your work. And thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.